Steve, Brian, how's it going? I can see Meredith's there yeah, as well. Yeah, she took off to go get something. So I'm going to be gone the next couple minutes myself. So, okie dokie. Um, battery bank issues. So, we've got your three poles for you. Uh, your opening one, how many battery ba base systems will you have or have you installed? Not will have. Um, the battery bank issue, which is what is the number one reason for battery bank problems? Mm -hmm. And number three is your pop quiz, a 55 pound lead ignit is placed in a 55 gallon bucket. What will happen? All right. Um, yeah, how you doing, man? Uh, I'm getting there. Yeah, bit by bit. Rough morning, so. Oh, oh no. Just couldn't make it from the bed to the couch or <laughs> from the couch to the office or no, I'm still suffering from the effects of COVID. So shit, you had it? I had it in January. I had no idea. It sucked ass. Yeah. Wow. Well, Not sorry to all. It's it's you know, all those dipshits or pardon my English, but all those dipshits that say it's just the flu haven't had it. No, they haven't. It's not the flu because I have respiratory problems now, um, severe shortness of breath. I can't run more than 150, 200 feet before I feel like I'm about ready to die. Um, oh, no. uh, COVID fog is real. It literally takes me, it takes, you know, your short term memory is, hor is horrible and it's just not good. I'm sorry to hear that, man. That's that sucks. Did anyone in your family get it? Yeah, my wife brought it home from uh, her her kids's uh, uh, parents' house. Her, oh, for... She's her, her she was her, her ex husband's parents' house. The grandparents of the kids they she took them over there on New Year's, and they gave it to her, and she brought it home to me. That sucks. Yep. Sucks. So you don't need, do you, I guess you kind of, are you still going to get vaccinated or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just because you had it doesn't mean that, that you don't have to get vaccinated. Your antibodies only, they, they don't even know how long it lasts. They, they say it's two to two to six months, depending on the variant. Right. And your physical, physical condition. I mean, uh, you know, the, while I had it, you know, the, the worst thing about having it was the the body aches and the cold chills. Hello, uh, solar installers and dealers across Canada. Thank you very much for joining us again today. Um, we're really fortunate today because we've got Steve Higgins and Jeff Miles from Rolls Battery Engineering. Uh, they're going to be presenting for about an hour and a half. Um, and you can do your Q&A throughout that. Please feel free to type into the Q&A panel, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Um, Jeff will be answering some questions for you. And then Steve will be doing a summary of all of those questions at the end of the presentation. And after the presentation, we're going to try and do the, the meetings again, like we did on Tuesday. Um, we'll be providing you with a link uh, to those meetings where we'll be doing sort of breakout rooms where you can talk with uh, Jeff or you can talk with Steve um, and they'll go through some project stuff and just have a whole bunch of face-to-face uh, -face time where you can actually uh, have some conversations. Um, to just a little bit of housekeeping about our dealer portal. There are some syncing issues for some new accounts. So if you're one of those new accounts, which is having some syncing issues, uh, don't worry, we know about it. We're working on it. Uh, it should be fixed hopefully by next week. Um, otherwise, all of the videos will be hosted in the dealer portal. Um, and if you are wanting to watch them before next week, uh, let me know. I do have some links that I can share with you. Um, other than that, Steve, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Cameron. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing well. I'm ready to to have a rock and roll, <laughs> rock and rolls. <laughs> webinar here oh better not let better not put that on a website <laughs> <laughs> all right um 
Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Higgins from Rolls Battery. Uh, this is a technical training presentation. Unfortunately, we're going we're gonna we're gonna talk about quite a few topics today. So I'm hoping to get completely through it. Uh, I don't think I'm going to. Actually, I'm pretty certain I'm not going to get through it. Uh, basically, we got about five hours of uh, information, and we're trying to squeeze in 90 minutes, and we've already chewed up about four of those minutes. So, uh, just a couple of things. If you look at your chat window. Uh, there should be a few links. There should be five links for some things. The, the, the PDF of the PowerPoint slides, the warranty claim form copy, the battery manual, uh, the website resources link, and the support page link. If you don't see that, let us know. Uh, we'll repost it again just to make sure. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the question pane. Uh, throughout, uh, we will be keeping an eye on the question pane, uh, and uh, we'll answer those as we go. At the end, we'll kind of try to summarize them and try to make sure we get all the questions answered. Uh, unfortunately, these webinars are not like uh, live presentations where we can see you raise your hand or we can see you uh, getting lost. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start. Um, here's my contact information if you don't already have it. Uh, this is my, oops, this is my contact information at the plant. My mobile number, most people don't call it, which is fine, and of course the toll-free number if you dial the toll-free number and dial extension 4020, it'll ring right to my phone. If you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. I'd be more than happy to, to help you out. Um, all these materials are available for download. Um, again, I've already given you the link for this entire PowerPoint. We're not going to get through all of it. Um, but this is available uh, at this tiny.cc um, webinar. If, you, if that doesn't work for you, you can send me an email and I'll send you a link to it. We also have a YouTube channel where we post these videos. We also have videos on the YouTube channel that are full versions of what we're gonna talk about today. So if you wanna spend the time, there's 34 videos, there's about 40 hours of content on our YouTube channel currently. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about some of the system sizing issues that we still see to this day. Um, I'm not gonna talk about every single one of them on these slides, you can read them as you go, but I'm gonna highlight the big ones. Um, and the number one one that we see to still to this day, even though I've been at Rolls for nine years, we still have this problem. Oversizing of the battery bank. You have got to stop the go home or, or go, go big or go home mentality when you start sizing battery banks. Um, I still get customers. We still get customers that call us up. They've got a 2000 amp hour, five parallel string battery bank, and they've got a thousand watts of solar. Um, you're just never going to get that charged. Uh, a lot of people will look at, you know, they'll, I've seen Magnum inverters, Magnum 4448s on uh, a single string of two volt uh, L16s. That's a 13 to 1400 amp hour battery bank. It's got a 60 amp charger, guys. It's never going to get those batteries charged with a reasonable amount of time. So you've got to look at your charging sources. You've got to keep your parallel strings down. As you get that battery bank larger, so should the charging sources, because if you don't, it's gonna take forever to get them to full. Um, not understanding the pluses and minuses different chemistries, okay? When you got a flooded lead acid battery, um, you need to cycle that battery. Flooded lead acid batteries, they want to cycle. They need to exercise. If you, if you set up a flooded lead acid battery, in, a, in, a, in an off-grid cabin that the customer is only there six months of the year, it's probably not the best choice for that bat, for that battery bank because the customer is not going to be able to top off the water. They're not going to be able to do the maintenance on the battery bank. Um, you know, a calcium-based battery is probably better for that, like uh, the AGM or even the gel batteries. Um, if there's going to be an off-grid cabin when they're not there six months of the year, you have to take in consideration how cold it's going to get. Just in the last two weeks, I've already got five phone calls. I keep track of them. I have five phone calls with folks up in Canada who have either frozen batteries or their batteries are starting to look like a slushy. Um, that is bad. Um, lithium ferrophosphate, LFP batteries, they're not the best batteries for all solutions. You still have to keep them warm. Um, it, it, most, uh, most of the LFP batteries, when you get below negative 10 degrees Celsius, they will stop working they will shut off to protect themselves. So you need to keep those things, you know, just keep in mind, batteries in general 
want to be kept at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, if you're not doing that, you could run into troubles. Um, shoehorning product, prepackaged systems, those are also problems. Make sure you understand the product that you sell. Um, I can't tell you how many times I'll talk to an installer or I'll talk to an end user and, and they've got like, for example, if you're using a Magnum BMK and you set the battery capacity up to 800 amp hours, that Magnum inverter or Magnum charge controller will terminate the charge when the current going into the battery drops below 2% of that battery bank capacity for three minutes. Battery manufacturers want 2% for 60 minutes and you can't adjust it. So what, in order to make that work, you have to adjust the battery capacity down. Uh, we talk to a lot of customers every week who I'd say 90% of our phone calls are system setting problems. Oh, let's see here. So it looks like we're gonna, we'll have to figure out a way to get you the links if the chat button's not, not coming up. Um, you need to understand that you got to consider load use by time of day and you got to consider it throughout the year in, 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 in Vancouver, BC or in Edmonton, Alberta or in uh, Barrie, Ontario or even in Nova Scotia and Spring Hill. In the summer, you might get four, four and a half, five and a half hours of sun, of decent sun on a stationary fixed array. You're not going to get four hours of sun on a date on a stationary array in the middle of January. It's just not going to happen. So you need to make sure you take that in consideration. Um, when you have a cabin system, you need to make sure that you take it in consideration for for snowfall. If the panels get covered up in snow, and the panels end up covered for two or three months at a time, and the customer is not cleaning them off, there's a good possibility that those batteries, regardless if they're AGMs or floodeds, there's a good chance that they are going to freeze. So remember, a fully charged battery will not freeze until negative 60 degrees Celsius. A battery at 70% state of charge will freeze at negative 6 degrees Celsius. Kind of talked about warm and cold temperatures. Uh, understanding the difference between a 12 volt, 24 volt, and 48 volt battery bank, um, those amp hours are all the same. Um, basically, they're the same battery banks. And so the only difference is, is if you use a 48 volt system, your cables are cheaper than a 12 volt system because you're going from four watt to maybe two watt. Okay, so those cables need to be definitely definitely sized and set up for the right application. All right, so we're going to talk about some sizing calculations. Um, it's important for any system that you do, whether it be an off grid system, a grid connected backup system, or a remote cabin system that you sit down and you look at, you do an energy audit on the system. You look, look at what the customers are gonna run for load wise. It's an excellent idea to make, to go over that load profile with that customer and make them sign to understand that if they change that load profile in any way, that they're going to affect the performance of their system. And the reason for that is, is the first thing that people do when you, when you start driving down the road, you've collected the check, you drove down the road, you cleaned it all up, and they're walking around the house, turning on, all, turning on and off all the loads to see how the system works. Um, you know, I've had guys install stuff like jacuzzi tubs after installations and they complain the battery bank wasn't holding any further. So you want to be cautious with that. Once you figure out what size batteries, typically for two, one, two, maximum three-day autonomy, you then size and select the components. Generally, you size the batteries to the loads, you size the solar to charge the batteries, you size the inverters to run the max load the, the max load surge rating, and then you size the generator to be able to, to run the bat to be able to charge the, the batteries through the inverters. Okay. And so it's important that you do that right. I can't tell you, you, you put a, a 10 kilowatt inverter on a system and you, you, you connect it to a five kilowatt generator, you're going to have all kinds of charging problems. So typically the generator is about one and a half to two times two times the size of the inverter system. So if you're gonna put on a dual set of magnum inverters, you're looking at a 12 to 16 kilowatt generator. If you're gonna put on an Outback Radian, then you're gonna want about a 12 to, to, to 16 kilowatt, maybe 18 kilowatt generator, depending on your altitude. Remember your altitude also affects how well that generator runs. 
So here's some basic load calculations. And so what I've done in the past, when I first started doing designs, I loved amp hours. The problem is, is that you start talking amp hours to most of your customers, their eyes glaze over and they don't know what the heck you're talking about. And so um, this is just an example in, in, in amp hour consumption, assuming a 50% depth of discharge and assuming 20% losses, okay? Um, so we'll just circle that and call that. And so, so for one day of autonomy for this system, they would need roughly a 787 amp hour battery bank. Same exact system when we're talking about amp hour capacity or watt hour capacity, which is easier to talk to your customer is, you know, you're looking 77.50 versus 0.2. That's just a rounding error, just a rounding number. It's no big deal. You're about the same system. Now, the question you're gonna get from your client is, okay, how long can I run this load? When, when you start talking in amps, well, if you draw 12 amps an hour, you can run it for X amount of time. Customers don't understand that. If you'd say you have 18.9 watt hours of total consumable energy, which is 50% depth of discharge, that means you could run a 1K load for about 18.5 hours, or you can run a 5K load. You can run a 5K load for 36 hours, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a 500 watt load for 36 hours. Once you get above 1K, you start getting above most battery C rates, so the C20 rates. So once you get into the 2K, 1.5, 2K, 3K range, you're discharging the battery faster than the battery can actually hold. And so you wanna be, you wanna make the customer aware of, the more aware of that. The more load they run, the less time they have, all right? And so this is the way I do things, is that I will size typically for a 25% depth of discharge. And the reason I do that is because most customers want that two days of autonomy, and I can actually extend this by upsizing my array, by making my array lot larger. Because if I'm charging more during the day, if the sun goes down and those batteries are 85, 95, 100% state of charge, I don't have to worry about running my generator and a lot less generator run times, which makes people happy because they're not having to spend money on fuel. And some of these remote locations, they're spending five, six, 10, $12 a, a, a liter just to, just to land fuel uh, some of these locations. Uh, for lithium, what I will typically do is I will size for uh, an 80% depth of discharge. So doing that 10 to 20% losses, assuming I need 18.9 watt hours of storage, I'll divide that by 0.80 and that will, I see your question, Eric. I will see if I can repost this, see if they'll pop up. Um, and uh, so I'll size for that 80%, which is basically 23.6 kilowatt hours. So for one day of autonomy, I need 23. For two days of autonomy, I'll need that. I'll need the 47 kilowatt hours of storage. So, and then I convert it to amp hours if you're still working on amp hour stage. And so that's basically what you're looking for. Most lithium batteries are rated in, in watt hours or kilowatt hours. So for summary, off-grid home, one day of autonomy, a 48 volt system, uh, you're looking at uh, 37.8 kilowatt hours. For, we're talking lead-based batteries. Let me see. If the... All right, so I just posted those links again. So hopefully everybody saw it. I wasn't sure if it was gonna translate if they didn't post earlier. So for that requirement, you're looking 37.8 kilowatt hours of storage or about 780 amp hours. Um, for this example, we'll use two parallel strings of S6 460, or I'm sorry, S6 L16HCs. That's a 445 amp hour battery. Two parallel strings will give you 890 amp hours. That's a pretty common system. Okay. Oops, that's what happens when I click on things. So uh, the next question is what PV array sizing should be used? And we'll talk about that. A little bit of levity. Um, Oh, well, this is a good time to pause. Hey, Cameron, why don't you go ahead and do that first poll? So why don't you guys take about uh, um, 20, 30 seconds or something like that to go ahead and answer these systems, these questions. Got a good range of people here, Steve. Good. So a little bit of levity while you're answering those questions. Don't be these guys. These are real installations. Please don't do this. Otherwise, um, 
you could or you could see the 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 wrath of old higgins so some of you might know what that sounds like so uh this is a real live solar installation really you're doing this and you expect to get paid you do know the sun doesn't work if it, the solar panels don't work if it doesn't see sun okay so be cautious of that um here's another system you know you got you know, this is actually one of those rented systems from Tesla or the the the, the Tesla folks. So, um, not really the best thing, and the customer is not really getting any payback. It's not a good thing. Hey Nick, I will get to that. I will get to that answer in a, in a sec. But I'm going to go the long route. So, again, common mistakes. If you're going to mow, if you're going to mow this area. Why not go through and weed whack the weeds that are growing up between the panels? Those are not producing any kind of power. Um, this one, you've got shading. You know, you're basically losing, you know, it, depending on how that array is set up, you're losing quite a bit of power on those panels. Um, you want your system to be somewhat code compliant. Uh, you show this to a code inspector and a lot of times they'll just they'll just pass out right there. So don't be these guys. This is a system in, in Eastern Oregon, uh, about 3,500 foot out, uh, elevation. This piece of plywood right here is the cover for those batteries. They're literally sitting outside. This customer wanted warranty on their batteries. Not a good thing. Um, this is a midnight system. And uh, notice the fine use of the battery temp sensors. By the way, the batteries are in this box. Why is it the battery temp sensors are attached to the wall of the container? Why are they round up on the top of the box? Why are they tucked into the side of the box? The purpose of those battery temp sensors, and we'll talk about it, we'll talk a little about it, is to adjust charging voltage. If you're not using these devices on your equipment, you're not getting a battery of warranty because battery companies don't warranty if you're not using a battery, if, you're, if, you're, if you haven't installed a battery temp sensor, because if you're not using a battery temp sensor, you're not changing your voltages based upon the actual temperature of the batteries. We've all seen this, this is corrosion. Um, a lot of guys don't understand where corrosion comes from. Corrosion comes from three things, overfilling, poor ventilation, or poor connections. In this particular system, the customer was literally filling into the, into the they were filling it to the brim on the battery and that was filling out and causing this corrosion on the batteries. The customer, the installer swore up and down they weren't being overfilled. Um, Jamie and I happened to be in Portugal at the time. This system's in Portugal. The installer called the customers, said we're going to come out and take a look and see what the problem is. Sure enough, we got there. We took these old hydro caps off. They were literally filled to the brim of the battery. Okay. And so that's what happens is, is when you're charging those batteries, it forces the electrolyte out, which can say, contains sulfur. That sulfur gets on the top of the battery and that causes this corrosion. All right, so an 890 amp hour battery bank, um, S6 L16 HCs, not S550s, S6 L16 HCs. There's a reason we went away from the part, those, those old part numbers. Full-time off-grid system. We want a recommended 10% minimum of the C20 rate of the battery bank. The C20 rate of that battery bank is 890 amp hours. Excuse my chicken scratch. Okay, ah, oh, there you go. I, I even put it in there. So recommended is 10% of 890, which would be 89 amps of charge current. Maximum would be a maximum of 178, 178 amps of charge current. Okay, I like to shoot for 15%. When I'm working on system designs, I will shoot for 15%. So I want one charge resource, either the solar array or the generator-based charger to be at that 15%. So I'm looking at about 120 to about 140 amps of charging current, okay? And the reason for that is time. The, the higher that charging current, the, the available charging current is within reason, the, 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 you're more likely to hit the time. Nobody in the world is gonna run a generator for an absorption time of eight to 10 hours. It's just not gonna happen. Um, for a cottage system or infrequent cycling, um, you can go as low as 5% because most of those systems, the customer shows up on Friday afternoon, they're there Saturday, they're, they might be there entire Sunday and they leave Monday morning or they leave Sunday night and they come back two weeks later. And so you have a whole two weeks 
as long as the as the solar as long as the loads are minimized when they leave the solar should be able to catch up if you don't if you don't minimize it and they just leave all their loads on especially in the winter and the solar panels get covered up in snow there's a good chance you're going to come back to some frosty batteries okay for agms um full-time off-grid again we recommend a higher charge rate on the agms and the reason for that is is yes they accept current better than flooded batteries but agms don't take charging abuse very well if you're not properly charging those batteries you're not getting up to a full 100 percent charge you know, two, three, four times a week, you're going to have problems. Um, the maximum, the absolute maximum is, is 30%, but we actually recommend 25% at the most. Uh, at 30%, they can get pretty toasty. And if the if they're not in a air conditioned space, uh, you can see you can see swelling issues with the batteries. Once the temperature of the batteries gets above 52 degrees C, the valve on the AGM battery pops and sticks open, and then it'll start to swell like a pregnant battery. It's not something that you want. Okay, so how do we get that? So if the charge conditions were perfect, okay, if we were getting a thousand watts per meter squared, no insulation, perfect angles of the sun, it's simple. It's amperage times voltage. So if we have a 48 volt battery bank and we need 89 amps, we're, we need 4,200 watts of panels. 178 amps, we would need about 8,500 watts of panels. But this isn't the case because with most solar panel arrays, the angling to the sun's not always perfect. The panels are often stationary. The panels are dirty. Uh, if you live in if you live in the Western North America, how many of us had uh, smoke this summer, last summer, the summer before, the summer before that, the last five six years? There's been a three been a three or four week period during the summer in the Pacific Northwest and where I live, where all you see is smoky skies. That's messing with your solar production. I tested it with my insulation meter this last summer, and the, the it would go from a normally about a 750 to 850 watts per meter squared. It's down to about three to 400 watts per meter squared. So you need to take that in consideration. So. Typically, you want to add two to three percent, two to twenty to thirty percent. So, for a so for a, for assuming charging loss, it's on that two parallel strings of batteries. I'm looking for a minimum of fifty one hundred watts to a maximum of eleven kilowatts, depending on the weather conditions, depending on your losses. Okay, or eleven kilowatts, and so. The problem there is, is the absorption times. And I'm going to get into that, okay? So a 5,100 watt array, a 5.1 kilowatt PV array will produce an average current of about 80 to 90 amps of current. Peak current is going to be about 106 amps, okay? On an 11 kilowatt array, peak current is going to be about 231 amps. Um, and then your average current is going to be about 175 to about 190. On this array, they're going to have to limit their charge controllers. And that's the purpose of the charge controller limit. So if you have, say you had four 80 amp charge controllers, you would you would set the current limit to be a total of 100 and basically 180 amps. OK, so you would basically set it to 60 or 70 amps a pop. Here's the problem on a 5.5 kilowatt PV array, assuming that 90 to 100 amps of current, my absorption time at 90 amps is going to be 4.1 hours my absorption time at 100 amps of current is going to be about 3.75 hours. That's going to be the absorption time for the solar charge controllers. Okay. An 8 kilowatt array, we're looking at 3.15 to 2.6 hours. A, a little bit higher current. That's what we're dealing with. The higher the current, the shorter that time is going to be. And so what you run into, what most systems do is... You know, you'll install the battery bank, the battery bank size to what the customer's loads are, the inverters, the customer wants to buy that, that brand new shiny radian with the optics and the, all the bells and whistles and they throw it in there and all they got money left is to put a 3000 watt array. So now, now their absorption time on that array is seven to nine hours. How many how many days in the wintertime are you going to get seven to nine hours of solar? 
that's going to take you four, five, six full days of sun to get that much power, to be able to get those batteries up to full charge. And, and that's if they're not covered up in snow. And so if you go for a long period of time on these two and three KW arrays and your absorption timers at seven to 14 hours, you're just never going to get to a full state of charge. And what's going to happen is, is those batteries are going to work great for about the first year. Year two, they're going to start to suffer. Halfway to, to the end of year two, what that's going to happen is they're going to call us and say, yeah, we need to warranty this entire battery bank because it's just trashed. It doesn't work anymore. Worked great for the first year and a half. Now I'm just fighting with it. Well, we're going to ask them these questions and we're going to unfortunately have to give them some hard answers from time to time. You know, so if we look at the, we compare these two, oops, you've got an eight, say we've got an eight kilowatt. I mean, that's even under the 11 kilowatt. Peak current's 160 amps. We're real current at that 120 to 140 amps. We're looking at, you know, peak current, 2.6 hours to 3.15 hours. And so what's happening is, is those batteries are getting to a full 100% state, probably nine to maybe 10 months of the year that way, there's only two months of the year that they actually have to start and run the generator unless they're doing an exercise, okay? If you design them like this, where the arrays are properly sized to get the batteries to a full state of charge, uh, at least a daily basis, the battery banks are going to last longer regardless of who makes them. So that's just definitely something to keep, a, keep, keep track of. Um, so charging batteries, it's important for settings. Again, 85, 90% of our phone calls, probably more, um, are going over charging settings. Uh, I had three phone calls this morning, all about charging settings. What do I charge these S550s at? What do I charge these 4KS25s at? Um, uh, batteries remain lower charging voltages. Batteries are gonna remain cooler. Lower temperatures are gonna maximize over a cycle life. You're gonna use less water. You're gonna get sulfation that's gonna become a problem. You're gonna to need to do equalizations, which, I, which I'm not a big fan of. And then of course the time's gonna be, you're gonna get a slower charge time. You may not hit that 100% state of charge, which is gonna result in sulfation. And that sulfation is gonna result in, in, in having to equalize. And then that'll result in having an internal corrosion of the battery because of the higher temperatures and so on and so on and so on. It just, it just, it just snowballs from there. Um, Higher charging voltages, you get faster charge times, you get more consistent capacities and less sulfation problems. You do get more gassing, okay? Which means you're gonna get more gassing from corrosion and, and or hydrogen accumulation. You have to make sure that your active ventilation works. On a flooded battery bank, you're required by code. You know, granted code's pretty weak right now, but you're required by code to have some sort of ventilation. I would suggest that you have active ventilation for flooded lead acid batteries and passive ventilation for AGMs and gels. All batteries gas. Do not install batteries in a sealed container box that's got sealed and or it's got seals and keeps all the air internal. Because if you do that, you could get a hydrogen ignition and that's not gonna be good. Um, more frequent watering is required, okay? You're going to get faster charge times, consistent capacities, and less sulfation problems, but you might have to use more water. If you charge at a lower voltage, you're going to use less water, but you're going to replace those batteries more often. I guarantee you a gallon of, 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 of four liters of distilled water is cheaper than buying new batteries every, four, every three to five years. Um, then, of course, higher temperatures can cause active material shedding, but that's where the temperature com compensation comes into effect. Uh, and that's where correct charging voltages come into effect. Um, this is a three-stage charging algorithm. Basically, we have bulk, absorb, and float, and we're gonna talk about these settings in, in detail here. Um, uh, just keep in mind, current as a, uh, and, and the bulk, it's a rising voltage. And I probably shouldn't be using red at this point, but so it's rising voltage with a constant current. So I is, cur is constant. In absorption, current is tapering while voltage holds, okay? This right here is the most important charge process of a battery, period. If you do not finish absorption on a regular basis, 
you will have battery problems. There's no ands, if, or buts. Okay. Float. Float's not a huge concern for, for, for me. And the reason it's not a huge concern for me is because by the time you've hit absorption and you've finished your charge on an off-grid system, you're not going to run your generator through float. That's just a waste of fuel for most people. Not to mention if you shut your generator down and it's still one, two o'clock in the afternoon or what I tell people to do is you start your generator at seven, eight o'clock in the morning. You run it till 10, 11 o'clock in the morning when the sun hits the panels and you're getting full production. Shut the generator down, let the solar finish the charge. And then what will happen is if that gets you into the 90, 95 percentile scale, you're, as long as you minimize loads, the next day you should get the full. What happens is, is a lot of people look at this chart and they don't understand the chart. There's two charts in our manuals. There's one for regular cycling up here, and there's one for infrequent cycling. And what those are for, infrequent cycling means kind of like a backup system. Or when you leave your cabin for three months, you lower your voltages to these voltages. So if it's a 48 volt system, you would drop your voltages down. While you're there and you're cycling those batteries, you run a little bit higher voltage because the harder you work the batteries, the more voltage, the more charging they're going to need to get to that full 100% state. The lighter you use, the less your voltage you're going to get. I have a customer in Montana that has a set of two YS31s on a house that he's there for five days, five days a month. When he's there, he uses this voltage. But when he's not, his charge voltage is actually 56.8. And at that voltage, he's still getting to a full 100% state of charge, 1260 to 1275 specific gravity. But there's so little load running and such a large array that he doesn't have to have his voltage at a high rate. And so what you do is you have to look at the specific gravities. You have to check the specific gravities to make sure you're getting to a full 100% state of charge. And that's what you're doing during the commissioning phase of a system is you're going out, doing a couple charge discharge cycles, and you're adjusting your voltages to match where your specific gravities lie at the end of those charge cycles. Now, the reason we tell you to use this chart is if you're using a battery temp sensor, you should assume that the battery temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, okay? Um, if you're not using a battery temp sensor, then every charge cycle or every month, you have to look at what your ambient temperature, or your, the temperatures that your batteries are getting while under charge and adjust, if, if, and adjust the voltage. If they're getting to 30 C, you need to change your charging voltage to 59.4. If they're getting to 40 to C, you're going to need to adjust your charging voltage down to 57.8. The purpose of that battery temp sensor is to adjust your charging voltages. If you set your charging voltages at 59.4 and you use a battery temp sensor, it's going to, if your temperature is 33, 30C, it's going to subtract another 0.6 volts from this. So it's going to drop at the 58.8 and your client's never going to get a fully charged battery. Okay. So you want to be cautious with that. You want to be careful with that. Install the battery temp sensor, put it in the right place. Don't cut quarters. It's a $30 part that'll save the life of your batteries, regardless of the make and manufacture of the battery. Okay. Um, same thing with AGMs. Uh, we have the same chart at 25 degrees Celsius. You're supposed to use this number. Okay. So if you're using the battery temp sensor, the customer is going to have to actively adjust voltage. If you're not using a battery temp sensor, I'm sorry. Your, your customer, your client is going to have to, your customer or your client is going to have to adjust those settings, um, which is why most battery manufacturers, roles included, Trojan, DECA, Crown, US Battery, Discover Battery, any battery company I know of, if you're not using a battery temp sensor, they will not warranty the product because you're never properly charging if you're not using a battery temp sensor. Um, the OPZV gels, same thing. Okay, so those are the optimum charging. These are the optimum charging voltages that you need for temperatures. Okay, on the lithium, on the LifePo4, the, the, the LFP models, it's a little different because the temperature sensing is done internally on the BMS. So all you do is you set up the bulk absorption voltage, you set up the flow voltage, and then you set up the termination current. And so when you set the voltage at 27.2 for a 24 volt model, 
um, what's going to happen is, is the BMS is going to look at the current and, and or you can tell your charge controller, or let's say you were using an Outback Flex Max 60, you would set, so if it's, let's say it's a 130 amp hour battery, you would set the, you know, you would set the end amps. Um, the problem with the Outback is it has a short timer on also. So you'd set the end amps at about one amp. You wouldn't set it to two because what will happen is, uh, what will happen is if you set it to two amps, it's going to hit two amps for like three to five minutes and then shut it off. It's never going to get it to full. So you need to lower that number to make sure you hit that target. And typically it's going to be one to, to half an amp. So 0.5 to one amp. So there's a question. Have you determined why the temp sensors are being, I'm assuming, omitted from those installs in many cases? Um, that's a great question. And the reason for that is, is that there are some inverter manufacturers and solar charge, con manu solar charge controller manufacturers that I will not name who are too cheap to put a part that costs them less than four or five dollars to put it in the box. Um, that's why. And so um, if you and, and there are some charge controllers out there, like I call I call them truck stop controllers. You can literally buy them in a truck stop. Um, you know, or we have a company called Harbor Freight that, that sells cheap stuff, at cheap tools and stuff like that around here. But there are some companies that that don't feel that charge con that temp sensors are necessary. They are 100 percent necessary. So try to buy products that have that, that that equipment or have that ability. Same thing applies for the for the. Same thing that applies for the LFPs on the 48 volts, you know voltages, float voltage, termination charge, all this stuff's very important to make sure. The great thing about lithium batteries is when you finish the bulk stage, they're only 94, they're about 94 to 96% state of charge. As you compare it to a lead-based battery, that's only about 80 to 85% state of charge. So the absorption time is pretty short on, on lithiums. All right, battery temp sensors. Um, I'm going to kind of talk, I'm going to talk briefly because this is an important topic where we have more questions. We had another question about them. This is why it's important to have a, uh, this is why it's important to have a battery temp sensor installed. You can actually see the battery temp sensor. First of all, you see this battery back in the back, and this is a flare camera. This battery back here is dry, absolutely bone dry. Matter of fact, you can see this battery here on the front. This battery here, you see how it's hot on the top and cold on the bottom? When that battery was autopsied, there was a line across this battery where the customer had run the batteries dry. Okay. You see this little, you see this little square right here? That's the battery temp sensor. Okay. It's just dangling there. It was it used to be attached to the side of one of the coolest batteries when it actually should be in this section of the battery bank on the, one of the long sides, okay? Um, uh, Brent, you're gonna get me to, to name the companies who don't provide temp sensors, I got a feeling so, but <laughs> um, I'll get to that question in a second, Brent. Um, Brent, Brent asked, uh, are you able to recommend a few charge controller manufacturers that, that I like? Um, I'm a big fan of the Outback charge controller. It doesn't come with a temp sensor, by the way, so you have to buy it separately. Um, unless you buy one of the FP kits, the FlexMax kits with the inverters and everything pre-wired. Um, uh, the Magnum charge controllers are great. Uh, I haven't had too many problems with those, even the Schneider MPPT60s. The Magnum PT100 is a decent controller if you have the ARC and they're connected so you can program it. I don't know why Magnum did the dip switch settings um, other than to save cost on a display. But uh, the dip switch settings are wholly incomplete. If you're using dip switch settings on the PT100 to program, I guarantee you're not charging those batteries correctly. Um, you know, some people will use the Solar Boost 50, but you need to make sure that, that it has the display so you can program it. Otherwise, you can't program it. What, you, what you're looking for in a charge controller or an inverter is the ability to program it because all Today, batteries are made a lot differently than where they were made 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so you need to have the ability to, to, to be able to control the bulk and absorption voltage. You need to be able to control the absorption time. 
and you need to be able to control the the absorption termination time that's called end amps return amps or finish the absorption time i'll get into that a little bit later about end amps and return amps but uh you need to be able to control that stuff i have not seen or tested a smart controller a smart charger that was truly a smart charger in the 26 years i've been involved with this business um smart chargers typically use return amps when the current goes below a certain point that's fine on a healthy battery if it's programmed correctly but if it's a default setting that you can't adjust you can't program for the battery manufacturer it's never going to be right so i talked about this a little bit earlier um I talked about a little bit of this earlier uh, about the, the absorption. So if your battery temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, you should actually be charging at 59.4. If the battery temperature is 68, or I'm sorry, 20 degrees Celsius, you should be charging at 60.6. The, the, the charger makes those adjustments. And so what happens is, this is what happens a lot. If the battery temperature is 30 C, the customer sets their absorption voltage at 58.8 or even lower, if it was set to 58.8, the battery temp sensor is going to drop that charging voltage even more. And at 30 C, it's gonna drop it by 0.6 of a volt. So now it's charging at 59, or I'm sorry, 58.2. Now you're never getting to a full 100% charge. Same thing goes with the, the, high, the, 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 the low temperatures. If it's 20 C, it should be charging at 60.6. If you set it to 60 and you're not using a battery temp sensor, what's going to happen is is now it's not going to be it's not going to be charging enough to keep the batteries warm because of the, the cold temperatures and what will happen is as you get excessively cold temperatures like in the negative 20 your specific gravities will be low and it'll cause them to freeze here are the calculations so for flooded lead acids it's five millivolts i'll get to your your other question here in a second plane um, your AGMs is four millivolts and your gels are three millivolts. Okay, so that's five millivolts multiplied by the number of cells per degree. So on the flooded lead acid, on a 48 volt system, your temperature compensation is 120 millivolts. It's 60 millivolts for 24 volt and 30 millivolts for 12 volts. Same thing for AGM and gel. Um, Outback's easy. Outback. You probe it, it, it's it's already in there. It's in the default. You can't change it. It's five millivolts all the time, no matter what type battery you use. Um, uh, Matt, or I'm sorry, midnight, you can program the temperature compensation three, four, or five millivolt or millivolts per degree C. Uh, Magnum, you can also set the temperature compensation for three, four, or five millivolts. On the Schneiders, I, I apologize for HES. I know you guys don't do a lot of don't do any Schneider stuff, but I'm sure there's people in the room that do. Um, for the Schneider equipment, you have to set the number. You have to, and it comes defaulted at negative 108 uh, millivolts per degree C. Um, if it's 120 and it, you're, te you're temp comping at 108, you're going to have problems. Um, I have not, I think I've found less than 10 in the last 10 years that were actually programmed correctly. Um, just quickly here for a second we actually have, are carrying the schneider products now as well which is uh huh? is new we're, we're ca carrying the schneider products now as well Yay! For, <laughs> that's uh yeah it's definitely a good thing good that's a good thing schneider's a, schneider's are pretty good products so um and as an old outback guy i i love i i worked at outback for nine years you know i still like the schneider stuff it it's 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 got some funky stuff with the scp but um, uh, I think they're decent products. I like them because there's a, there's a lot of programming functionality um, that you can do with them to make your charging happy. So one of the issues about four or five years ago that we identified, and we're still having some issues with a couple of the manufacturers, um, is that people love to put battery temp sensors on the, so on, the, on the top of the battery. There's even a couple of manufacturers, including Schneider, who make their temp sensors so you bolt it to the terminal. Well, this is a FLIR camera pit picture image of a battery bank. Red is hot, blue, yellow is cold, okay? So at this point right here, the temperature of the battery is 30 degree, 37 degrees Celsius. But right here, your temperature is in the 60, 65 degrees Celsius range, okay? Um, so, 
if if you put your battery temp sensor up here, are you going to be getting a good battery temp sense reading? So for all the all you folks who were installing Magnum products, uh, Morningstar products, Schneider products that have temp sensors that bolt to the terminal, you're not accurately representing what the actual temperature of the battery is. It's an it's an easy fix. You just take the temp sensor. And you run, you, you, you take some electrical tape and you tape it to the side of the battery. And then I'll take two or three rounds around the battery to, to fix the, the, the temperature sensor to the side of the battery. Okay. Um, so batteries want to be installed. It looks like Jeff's typing the answer right now, but batteries want to be installed. Doesn't matter what type of battery, who the manufacturer is, even if it's lithium, they want to be at 25 degrees Celsius. They're going to work their best at 25 degrees Celsius. At hotter temperatures, you actually get more capacity, but you get less cycle life. At colder temperatures, you get less capacity, but you get more cycle life because they're cold, uh, but they can freeze. And so um, you want to try to keep them as close to 25 degrees Celsius as possible. Okay. So if that involves putting in uh, like concrete heating blankets or heating blankets, like uh, water heater heating blankets to keep the batteries warm in the, in the wintertime, um then you know if you're doing an installation in yellow knife and it's not going to be used and you've got plenty of solar put in a concrete heating pad heating blanket they typically cost a couple hundred dollars for a for a, 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 a an 80 90 100 square foot pad that you just put over the top of the batteries to keep them nice and nice and warm in the in the summertime um for customers who are installing in very hot locations, I do a lot of systems in the Caribbean and Africa, Latin America. I do a lot of maintenance on systems. Um, I just walked in. I was just March of last year. I went to a site in the Bahamas, my last trip on the road, by the way, uh, went to a site in the Bahamas where the customers were having problems with their batteries. And there was a $60,000 battery bank basically sitting in a lean to getting abused by the sun, the Bahamian sun and, and salt water spray. And, you know, that you might as well just hand me the $60,000 and I'll be more than happy to take care of it. So, um, so you want to make sure you try to keep them as, as reasonable as possible. So battery temperature sensing locations, battery temperature sensors should be attached to the side of the battery at or below label height on the side of the battery. Okay. Now, Ideally, the battery temp sensor on the Series 5000 should be inside the case. I'm not going to nick you on that. You're not going to get your best reading, but it's better than not having a temp sensor at all if you just mount it to the outside of the, outside of the case. Don't trust the double-sided sticky tape because it will come off. It, the first hot summer, it'll, that glue will melt and it'll drop off and be sitting on the floor. Run some electrical tape or some duct tape around that to affix it to the side of the battery. Um, if you're putting it on the top, like for example, here's a terminal temp sensor. There's a there's a midnight temp sensor sitting on the top of the battery. That temp sensor is not doing those temp sensors aren't doing you a darn good. Um, oh, okay. So now I'm going to answer Blaine's question. Do any of these remote monitoring systems have available alarm, alarm status for remote monitoring? Um, not that I know of. Um, the Outback ones with optics, I think you can program text alerts into it or email alerts when voltage goes below a certain point, but I'm not uh, very well versed on the rest of them. All monitoring systems, all battery monitor kits have their own little problems. Um, Outback's got its issues, Midnight's got its issues, Magnum, Morningstar, Schneider, they all have their own little issues. Even the Bogart trimetrics and pentametrics have their little issues. And that's where it goes back to understanding the product that you sell. You need to understand that product as well, if not better than the manufacturer, because your customer is going to come to you, come to you with those questions. So um, uh, what type of sealant basically is just a, a standard, we use black uh, RTV. Um, so that never answered my question of the warranty. Uh, Ebon, if you can, uh, actually Jeff's typing you an answer right now. Um, as for the blanding, heat, heating blanket, um, you're gonna wanna look at how much heat it generates and what kind of space you're heating. So in this particular con condition, if you've got six volts, say you got three parallel strings of batteries, where would you put the temp sensor? 
there's two locations. If this is out in the open or in a box, in a, in a, in a box, which it probably should be for some of the code compliance that, that's coming up, uh, the temp sensor would be here, 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 or here. That is where I would put the temp sensors. I'll put X marks, X marks the spot. Let's call it stars, okay? If there's a wall here, let's say these are up against the wall here, which I wouldn't advise because it's hard to service these batteries back against the wall. Because uh, now you got to lean over the batteries to get to them. But if they're like this, I'm going to put the temp sensors in one of those spots. I'll just circle those. Okay. So those are going to be the warmest locations of the battery bank. Um, so the, the Lance, that's a good question. These batteries should be spaced one to three inches apart. Okay, for airflow, that's all we care about. We want that one to three inches apart. In warmer environments, closer to three inches. In colder environments, closer to one inches. I have clients that I, that I tell to, in the summertime, space them apart two to three inches. In the wintertime, put them up together, put them up to each other. That way, that internal heat helps keep all the batteries uh, uh, cool. I'm not sure about the code requirements that require cell spacing. This is what you don't do. This is a battery temp sensor. It's sitting on top of the battery. Um, again, here's that picture again. Battery temp sensor sitting on top of the battery. Okay. This is a this was an almost 100% sealed box on a boat. Battery temp sensor sitting on top of the battery. If that battery temp sensor had been properly mounted, you know, on the side and properly spaced the what would happen is that battery temp sensor would have sensed that temperature getting so hot and it would back it would have backed down the voltages and it probably would have given an, a high battery temperature error alert to the inverters that it was connected to okay absorption time why is setting it so important we talked about some of the calculations you have to get to a full especially on lead based batteries you have to get to a full 100% charge at least once a week if not two, three, four times a week. The more often you get to 100% full, the less problems you're gonna have with cell balancing and having to do equalization charges, okay? On a flooded lead acid battery, when you complete the bulk stage and enter the absorption stage, you're about 80% state of charge. On AGMs, it's about 80 to 85. On gels, it's about, eight, it's about 85%. And on LFP, it's 94 to 96%, depending on the, depending on the make and model. Okay, so it's the, the absorption charge is the finishing charge. If you don't do it, you're gonna have all kinds of problems. We talked a little about this already. I'm not gonna go over it again because we're kind of crunched for time. I've only got about 15 minutes or so before I've got to get into the warranty talk. Um, how do you calculate the absorption time? Um, point for flooded batteries, 0.42 multiplied by the C rate divided by the nominal, nominal charge in bulk not your peak, okay? 0.42 is the assumption that you're gonna lose about 60% of your total charge current during the absorption stage, okay? Those of you who looked at battery banks when the inverters and absorb, it's not doing 80, 90, 100 amps anymore. It's doing 30, 40, 50 amps, okay? So you have to take that in account for your overall time, okay? C20 rate, of course, that's the, that's the amp hour capacity of the battery at the C20 rate. Nominal current, that's the current in the bulk stage, and I typically will use an average, and so I'll measure it. If I know I've got a uh, an outback radian that can do 120 amps of charge current, um, I'm going to derate that to about 85 to 95, maybe 100 amps of current. Um, be careful because the meters on most of this equipment, I think the only inverter out there that has a utility grade meter is the Sunny Island. Okay, that's the only inverter I've ever measured current and gotten an accurate reading of the current, okay? Magnum, Outback, Schneider, everybody, Victron, everybody is typically five to 20% off. If you, if you, I looked at a site up in Northern Ontario uh, about three years ago, um, inverter was saying it was pumping 90 amps of current into the battery bank. You put a current meter on the battery bank, it was 65, okay? That would be the number I use to set my absorption time, not the 90 amps. Okay, so it's important you make sure you get that. So we talked about this earlier, uh, 12, 340 watt panels, 80 amp charge controller, 6,000 watt inverter, 
Um, I'm going to kind of go over this a little fast. Um, 12, 340 watts, that's about 4,000 watts of solar divided by 48. I'm going to get a peak current of about 85 amps in optimum conditions. Realistically, this 4,080 watts, peak current's 85 amps. I'm going to be C65 to 75 amps of average current. That's the number I'm going to use. Okay. Again, I might, and I use 60 to 70 here. 0.42 multiplied by 890 divided by 60 amps. So, and then 70. So my absorption time is going to be between that 5.3 to 6.2 hours. Okay. If you leave it at the default of two to three hours for most of the products out there, what will happen is, is those batteries will work great for about the first year. And then they'll call us and then I'll start walking them through the settings and they'll say, yeah, my, my Outback uh, FM80 is set to two hours absorption, which is the default setting. I said, well, your, your, your charge controller is much like a child. It does what you tell it to do. And if you tell it to charge for two hours, when it's done, it's going to think the batteries are in flow and that's going to cause you problems. Um, Again, same thing with the inverter. The inverter may be capable of 120 amps of current, but it's not going to be 120 amps of current. It's going to be between 80 and 90 amps of current. <laughs> nice, nice message there, Travis. I appreciate that. Yeah. What, where in the world do you live where children listen to what they're being told? Well, some children do. Some don't. So I've got one that does, and I've got one that doesn't. So. So um, again, this is kind of rehashing. And so I'm gonna kind of skip over it because we've already kind of talked about it. If you have any further questions on it, you can email me or you can give me a call. I'd be more than happy to walk through that. Um, you know, again, most manufacturers absorption times defaulted at one to three hours, lead-based batteries. Make sure the nice thing about lithium batteries is absorption times typically, because the batteries are at 94 to 96% of state of charge, they're typically only you know, 30 to 60 minutes on, on, on lithium batteries. Um, and then last but not least is end amps. It's, all, it's called end amps, return amps, or tail current, depending on the product that you're using. What it is, is that when you're using a current-based charger, like for example, the chargers that we use at the plant, we set the voltage parameters, we set all that, that but what happens is what determines the transition from absorption to float is when the current goes below that two to 3% of the battery bank capacity for 60 minutes, that battery is full. It's not accepting any more current. There's no point of keeping the charger on at that point. So it transitions to float, okay? Um, the problem is, is that there's a couple of manufacturers and now that you're selling Schneider, I can beat up on Schneider too. Like for example, Schneider, if you set the battery capacity on an XW plus or an MPPT 60 or an FM, an MPPT 80, if you set the battery capacity at 890 amp hours, it's going to automatically set the end amps, the, the, the absorption termination to 2% of that number for three minutes. Magnum does the same thing. Okay. Um, so Schneider and Magnum does the same thing. Victron does kind of the same thing. Um, whomever's using solar. Solar, you can't set the absorption time. You set the, the battery capacity, and Solar takes a percentage of the battery capacity for, uh, I think it's three minutes, but it might be five minutes. Okay. So how do you offset that is, is that if you have an 890 amp hour battery bank, two parallel strings of S6, L6, and HCs, which would be 890 amp hours at the C20 rate, I'm going to set my battery capacity at about 600 amp hours to start. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm going to tell the customer, I want you to do, I want you to spot check 10 cells. I want you to go out and take a specific gravity or you go out, and take a specific gravity. And if those 10 cells are say 1240 to 1250, I'm going to lower my number a little further or I'm going to lengthen my absorption time. Okay. Um, if I get, uh, if my specific gravities are 1275, 1280, 1290, then I'm going to raise my, my amperage. Or I'm gonna, or I'm gonna shorten my absorption time, and so kind of treat it like, a, 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 you know, tuning a radio. You have a coarse adjustment, a big adjustment, and that's voltage, and then you have fine tuning adjustments, and that's in that that's absorption time, and that's end amps, and so you can tweak with those numbers to get it right, and but you have to check your specific gravities. 
you have to look at those specific gravities to tell where they're getting at the end of the day. If they're getting low every single day, then you need to get a little more aggressive. If they're going too high, then you need to become less aggressive. The bad news is, is that's going to change two to three times a year. Okay. For my system at home in the summer, I don't need to charge as much because there's nobody in the house. Everybody's out. We're not using as much energy. In the wintertime, I'm using, I'm using more energy because everybody's home surfing the internet, playing video games or watching TV. And so, and you have to consider how that customer is using that, that system and that site. Okay. And so um, for Rolls batteries, we want to see 2% for a period of one hour. So if you're using like, for example, the only product that I know of that incorporates time, which is the Outback FlexNet DC, a lot of people beat up on the FlexNet DC because it does have its issues. But the nice thing is, is that you have multiple parameters you can set. You can set the, you can set the end amps percentage. You can set that for 2%. And then you can set a time, a delay timer. So it's got to, so the current's got to go below that 2%. That's 17 amps for a full 60 minutes before it thinks the batteries are full. Okay. You can't do that with Magnum and Schneider and a few other manufacturers. So you kind of have to trick the inverter how to make it work. So, and this all goes back to, um, I talked about all this stuff. This all goes back to um, uh, learning the product that you sell, understanding the product that you sell. If you sell Outback products, you literally should be reading that manual and your boring times or your slow times, if you got them or your texts and going through it and understanding how those, how those products work. Um, okay, let me make sure I'm not, Okay, I'm getting to the second poll question here in a second. So we're gonna spend about 15 minutes talking about, or about 10 minutes talking about troubleshooting. I'll try to get through as much as I possibly can, but I won't get through a whole lot because I still have to talk about war the warranty process. Um, uh, Gord, I, uh, we don't make graphene batteries uh graphene you see a lot of those in in lithium based there's some graphene and lead um, but not much we haven't seen a whole lot of improvement with the graphene technology so um so batteries don't die they're murdered okay most of the installations out there i've seen and i've seen a lot of installations because i when i do travel i typically do a lot of site visits uh, a lot of times when I go visit a distributor or I'm doing a training, I have a day or so after the training and I, I try to go visit customer sites. Um, you know, so I've seen quite a few installations. Most of those systems, they are, and I get to see a lot of the bad systems because those are the ones that aren't working. And you get out there and you try to, try to fix as many problems as you can. Um, how a battery works is that when you discharge, when you, what you have is you have a jar, okay? In that jar is a lead oxide plate and a lead plate. So they're two unlike metals in a vat of, of electrolyte, which contains 32% sulfuric acid, okay? When you discharge that battery, the sulfur from the sulfuric acid populates on the plates. When you charge that battery, the sulfur goes back into the electrolyte. And that's why it's important, especially with lead, with flooded lead acid batteries, to look at the specific gravities. Because if you got a battery and you measure it and it's a 1.240 specific gravity, that means your battery is low because it comes out of the planet 1.265. And it's going to range between fully charged between 1260 and 1275. So it's important to understand that. And that one of the biggest reasons it's important to understand that is. If I took a 55 pound lead ingot, which is what we get at the plant, and I drop that into a 55 gallon bucket of water, what will happen? And here's your, oh, Cameron, oh, there he is. And here's your, your, other, your other quiz question. So just to, just to give you a little hint, I'm not David Letterman, so we're not playing Will It Float. So that, that gives you a 50-50 shot to get it right. <laughs> well, what happens is, and I've totally spaced off the third question, Cameron, so you're going to have to remind me uh, when I get there. Um, what will happen is what happens to water or what happens to lead when it's submerged in water? How many people have heard of Flint, Michigan? 
Uh, I'd ask that person, but unfortunately I can't see hands. Well, in Flint, Michigan, it must be about eight, nine years ago now, maybe 10 years ago now, they discovered that they hadn't replaced the city's old lead fittings in over a hundred years. And what was happening was, is as the, as that lead flow, as that water flows through the lead, uh, and the lead dissolves. Lead is soluble in water. It will eventually dissolve. And so when you have a battery that's sitting in a low specific gravity for a long period of time, one of the reasons that you're losing battery capacity is you're losing plate material. The plate material, the actual lead plates that, that, that provide you the current is dissolving. It is, you're losing that capacity. Um, George, uh, can an FM60 from 2006 charge a lithium battery? Um, that's actually a question more for Outback, but I can't answer it. Um, yes and no. Um, we definitely probably should meet after, I guess we're still breaking up into groups and you can answer that question in, in a smaller group, but yes, it can, but you've got to tweak with the settings to make it work. Um, it's not automatic like the new ones that where you can just set it up as a lithium battery and then program, uh, program or set your programming uh, programmables. All right. So troubleshooting symptoms. Number one cause of symptom is lack of capacity. That's probably what you see. Customer's generator is going to run all the time. You know, you see lots of excess water usage or no water usage. You go through and you go to top off water and you got to sell it. It's not consuming any 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 water while it's being charged. Uh, typically L16s and smaller, you have to check water about once a month. Bigger batteries than L16s, like these, like the the 6CS25 here that's pictured, um, you can typically get away 45 to 60 days depending on your site. Uh, the hotter the site, the more you have to check the water. Um, Imbalance cell heating or excessive gassing. Now that I've said that, um, here's an example of excessive gassing. Hopefully you guys can see the video. Um, if your battery looks like a locomotive, granted we do look, we do manufacture locomotive batteries, but if it's doing this, it's done. Um, uh, actually I do, I will get that in a second, Jeremy. Um, Yes, uh, if your battery is doing this, basically what happened with this battery, the, the, these batteries, is you can tell they haven't been taken care of very nice. They're not very clean. I can see the top of the batteries. I guarantee you this customer has run these batteries dry at some, po some point, and maybe they have been overfilling these batteries. And so that's what happened, is there's enough corrosion on those plates that basically that corrosion is turning into heat on the plates. It's not good. Um, Specific gravity, state of charge. And so um, state of charge percentage, 1255 to 1275. Well, that's a range. For solar, we like to see the specific gravity between that 1265 to 1275 for a fully charged. The 1255 to 1260 is considered fully charged for industrial or motive power applications like forklifts or um, railroad, railroad, diesel locomotives, those kind of things. We use a lower a uh, uh, specific gravity electrolyte in those batteries because it makes the batteries last longer. They're not cooking them as much. The 1265 to 1275 is where we like to get them. The spec on the batteries is 1280. So we still want you not, not to get it as high as, high as 1280 um, because that will, that'll give you larger amounts of capacity, but you're gonna use up that, you're gonna use up the battery life with that capacity. Um, so you wanna be careful of it. Now, um, Jeremy asked a question about the uh, specific battery hydrometer. Um, not a big fan of uh, a lot of, I'm not a big fan of the hydrometers, turkey based or hydrometers. Uh, there's only one box style hydrometer that I can recommend, but they typically read the ones I have uh, from uh, midnight will read about five to 10 points high. So uh, to a calibrated battery refractometer. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, I'll take this out of the box, but this is a, uh, refractometer that I bring in. I typically bring five to six of these whenever I go to a third world country because they have a hard time finding them. This is a, I'm going to have to get rid of my background. Hold on one second while I get rid of my background. Yep. I'm not going to be able to do it quickly. So 
anyways, uh, you can't really, maybe you can see it better this way, but it's kind of blending in with the background. This is a refractometer. It's just an inexpensive little refractometer. Um, I bring them in from China. Um, I take them with me to, to, to places like Latin America or Africa and, and sell them at cost. Basically, what you do is you take a drop. I'll hold them like this, like I'm holding a cigarette or a cigar. And then I'll take a towel or something and put it on my pinky. And then I'll take the other hand. I'll use the dipper. And then and I'll set my phone on voice record. And so I take the dipper, I drop it into, I put it into the battery. I take literally a drop out and put it on there like that, close it, look through it, and then open, wipe, and move on to the next cell. And so I do that whole process. I can do 24 cells in less than eight minutes. Um, and the reason I can do that is I talk my way through it. I don't stop and write down settings for each or the specific gravities for each one. I take those specific gravities on the recording and then I go back through and log them at a later date. Um, um, so if you go on to, I think, uh, HES sells them. So, um, yep, you can use them. Typically these are multi-levels. These, this has a scale for glycol, uh, purpling glycol. There's another glycol and battery acid. Um, if you, if you can't find one or HES doesn't have them, I think HES sells them now. Um, but you can find them on Amazon. So. They're not as cheap as that one. I buy that one because it's cheap. It's like, they're like $9 from China. And I buy, I buy 10 or 20 at a time. And then I take them with me to third world countries because um, they have a hard time finding them. The next slide is, is the absolute, the bane of my existence in the solar and uh, the battery business. Um, uh, I've gotten a few complaints because I will not answer this question. I try to avoid this question as much as possible. Customers will call me and say, Steve, I want to know what my voltage is versus my state of charge. So I want to measure voltage versus state of charge. My answer to that is, is you cannot. And the reason you cannot is because you don't know how much load is running and the amount of load is going to affect the battery voltage, which is going to affect your state of charge number. Okay. Try not to, I, I understand looking at voltage. I do the same thing. I look at voltages across the battery and, and I, I, I try to make an interpretation for the state of charge as well. But that I just use that in the back of my mind. A lot of people take it as the, as, as the word, as law, and it just does not work. Um, I can tell you that a fully charged 12 volt battery will measure 12.78 after three hours of rest. A 24 volt battery, 25.56, 32 volt battery, 34.8, 48 volt battery, 51.1. Okay. I can tell you that at 50%, three hours of rest, no load, they'll measure 12 volts, 24 volts, 32 volts, and 48 volts. Okay. And then the volts per cell is 1.75 for a 0% battery with no load. Okay. I cannot tell you that at 29.6, without knowing the load, what the battery, what the state of charge is, or 44.2 or whatever. And so you want to be very cautious with that. Um, on AGMs, I'll use voltage more, but I prefer to do a load test on AGMs. And unfortunately, I'm not going to get to the load test, uh, but I do have a YouTube uh, PowerPoint that's on you, a video on YouTube that talks about how to do a load test. So Travis, you and I, we can talk about that offline or in the next room. Um, sulfation, sulfation is bad, especially if it's there a long time. This is what a sulfated plate looks like. This is what a sulfated plate looks like. This is what a sulfated plate looks like. It's not a bad thing short term, but it's a bad thing long term. And so you want to try to avoid it. It's the most common failure of a battery that we autopsy. These are batteries down in Jamaica that I autopsied a few years ago. Customers swore up and down that they charged them and they didn't. Um, all right. So unfortunately, I'm not going to get through all this. By the way, this is the absolute worst hydrometer ever known to man. Avoid it at all costs. It will be, you know, maybe the made in USA will be an indication of how bad it is, but it's bad. Um, it's it it they often read high. Um, other thing to watch out for is when a customer tells you it was in the green, if, oh, let me, uh, oops, let me delete that. Let's 
screen. Okay, if it's in the green, that's not good. 1250 is not good. Okay, so you wanna you wanna be cautious with that. If it's in the green, the 1250, we want, if this is a if this is a Rolls battery, we want this, 1265 to 1275. Um, so on a load test, I use the house. So I go to that, if I'm going, if I'm at a site, I will use the house as the load. And so what I'll do is I'll take the batteries, figure out what the C10 discharge rate is, say it's 60 amps of DC current, then I'll load it down at, at, at that. So I'll start turning on loads of the house. If I can't get enough loads and I typically have a couple ceramic heaters in my truck, I'll plug those in and, and turn them on and try to keep the current as close to 60 amps as possible. Um, measuring, and then what you do is you measure the voltage under load as it discharges. Let's say there's six volt L16s. When the voltage gets to 5.4 volts, let's say it took two and a half hours to get the 5.4 volts. I expected five hours because I was discharging at the 10 hour rate. That means that tells me that those batteries are about 50% capacity. There's a whole one and a half hour uh, webinar on YouTube already on this. And I think that me and Cameron are probably gonna do uh, four or five or six more webinars on that kind of stuff over the next few months, hopefully. So we've been talking about it for a while, but we'll get there. Um, anyways, um, so this is bad things. This is the sediment. The one thing to point out is if you get this inside your hydrometer, uh, or you can see that inside your uh, your fill tube for the uh, refractometer. That that's indication of of the batteries are getting hot. Either they're over equalizing or they're just getting hot. And so you want to try to avoid that. All right. So unfortunately, I knew this was going to happen. That's what I tried to warn you about in the beginning. I thought there's a there's a lot of information that we've got to talk about that um, uh, that I needed to address, we, that we needed to address. Um, and then we were gonna talk a little about warranty. Um, warranty is for manufacturing defects. Warranty is to take care of our screw ups. Warranty does not cover abuse, undercharging, freezing, dropping, shipping damages. That's not a manufacturing defect. That's something that's come in after the fact, okay? Um, we feel we've been pretty lenient. We feel that, you know, granted I tightened it up a little bit about nine years ago, but people are kind of used to that now. Um, we could tighten it up a bit more, but we're not gonna. We replace about 1% of our yearly production under warranty. Um, of that 1%, it's actually about uh, three quarters of a percent. Of that three quarters of a percent that we replace on warranty, we find less than 20 cells a year that are an actual manufacturing defect, at least on the flooded batteries. It's about, it's about, it's probably about maybe just under double that for the gel cell batteries. Um, and we haven't had a lithium manufacturer, a lithium failure yet. And we've been selling those for about a year and a half yet. So um, when you do a warranty, we can't be there to look at it with you. If you're the installer, you're the end user, you know, I'm generally between, you know, you know, 100 to, to 5,000 miles away from the site. And so we can't be there to see it. So this form, the warranty claim form, and hopefully everybody can see it, I think I'm sharing it, is... is yeah, what, you're good, Steve. Okay, what we use to troubleshoot it. And so it's important to make sure that we get as much information that we need. I'm going to highlight that, okay? And this first, this first section here, it's really important that this entire first section is filled out to the best of your ability. If you don't include date codes, you know, you don't put the date codes in there, you're going to have a problem. Uh, remember, dates are month, day, year. And so uh, this kind of screws with the U.S., the, the people in the U.S., because we do day, month, year. And so it messes with them quite a bit. They always complain they can't put the dates in there. Uh, there's a little drop down menu that you can select and, 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 and key in the date if you want. Um, emails, we have to have email contact information. We have to have the customer name and the installer or distributor where the customer bought the batteries from so we can track them. The battery model. The S4000 series batteries contain about 200 different part numbers. The S5000s, probably about another 100, 150 different part numbers. If you write S4000 there, I have no idea what batteries you have, okay? 
try to get as much information as you possibly can. Um, it blows my mind how many people um, uh, don't know how many watts of solar panels they have or what type of charge controller they have or what type of inverter they have. Cracks me up. I, I, I laugh every single time I think, because, you know, I mean, granted I'm in the industry, but you know, I know I drive an F-150 pickup truck. I know the wife has a Nissan Murano or a Nissan, uh, whatever her car is. I don't drive it very much. You know, I know I, you, you have to have that basic information when you call a tech support department of anybody. If I call Sony because my headphones died, I need to tell them what the model number is. And otherwise, they won't be able to help me. Um, installation dates, uh, you know, that's important to have. This section, the application and charge source section, this gives you an idea of what you're doing charge source. Um, it's primarily for uh, industrial applications. Most people don't fill this out, which, you know, I'm fine unless there's a specific question about it for it not to be filled out. Filled out. For renewable energy systems, this is the section for renewable energy systems here. Um, better pointer, but this is a very important. It's it's it, we have to know how big your array is. Your solar charge controllers go here. Make model quantity charger output. Your inverter models go here. Type and then your settings. Okay, there there aren't all the settings because we're we're dealing with you know there's three settings for an Outback FM60 or Outback FM80 or Outback F100 FM100 that makes sense. There's the absorption voltage, the absorption time, and the indamp setting. If you have a Schneider, there's absorption voltage, battery type, battery capacity, uh, battery temperature compensation. There's a lot of other little settings. For Magnum, Magnum, there's some different settings. Victron, there's different settings. And so we're asking you base information. We may come back to you and ask you more information. Um, but this gives you an idea of what the system you're operating. So if you've got, you know, if the customer knows they've got 4,000 watts of solar, and let's say they're, you know, 13, or 12 panels, let's say they're 380s, you know, so, you know, that's just what I usually get. And so an FM, FM80, and then let's say uh, Radian, and then they go through and they enter their information. And so uh, there's bulk voltage, uh, the, amp the, amp the amperage that you're expected to see during the charging. You know, most customers don't know what this is, and that's fine, we can figure that out. But we need to know what the voltage programming is. So if it's 28.8, or, and if it's, you know, say four hours for absorption time and 29.4 for, for four hours, okay? We need to know that information to be able to properly troubleshoot with the customer. Um, lastly, they have got to do the specific gravities. They have got to do the voltage. If they're AGM batteries, you know, if they're AGM batteries, so they're S460 AGMs, all I'm looking for is the open cell voltage, which would be say 6.2 or 6.3, for each one, Oop. as I'm running through 6.3, oops, I, you know, these are easy to, easier to print out and fill out. I'm not a huge fan of the online form like this, but if you got four batteries and your settings are right, you know, then it's simple. If, you know, if your loaded voltages and this one drops down to two volts and these are all six volts, you're good to go. If it's a flooded battery, we're looking for the specific gravities. It's nice to have the cell temperatures. And if you're gonna do a load test, you tell us how many amps of current. So let's say there's 40 amps of current, okay? And so, and, and the whole purpose of this form is to prevent the 15 to 20 emails back and forth, trying to get the information, trying to get the troubleshooting information to qualify for warranty. And so, there's things that we're looking for, you know, to qualify for warranty. I mean, is it set up right? I mean, for example, let's say this is the S60, 460 AGM. So we go, so let's see here, S6-460 AGMs. And you had, let's say we had four in series. And then let's say you were charging at 28.8 and your inverter was 29.4. Well, what I would say is if your batteries are low capacity, and we're doing 12, we're doing 12, uh, 12 panels for 4,000 watts. So that's going to be about, about 70 to 75 amps of current. Um, 
I'm going to say, well, your absorption time is point. Uh, by the way, the absorption timer on the AGMs is a little bit shorter. So the multiplier is 0.38 versus 0.42. So 0.42 or 0.38 multiplied by 415 divided by that 70 amps of current that's an absorption time of 2.25 hours. So if you're absorbing at a lower voltage for a longer period of time, you may not be getting that right. So what I'm gonna, what I would tell you to do is I want you to set this for three hours for your absorption time. And I want you to bump up your absorption voltage to 29.4 and run that for two to three weeks and see what we get for capacity. If your capacity comes up, great. It was just because you were undercharging the batteries a little bit. If the past the capacity doesn't come up, let's say you do this and we come up with, with these still these same voltages, then there's probably a dead cell. It probably wasn't caused by the low voltage, but longer absorption times. Um, and so we're gonna replace that battery. But if you have 28.8 and your absorption time was set at a default of one hour, is that a manufacturing defect if the capacity batteries, if the capacity of the batteries is dead? No, it's not. It's a settings problem. Now, will I outright void the warranty if you just got one dead cell battery? Probably not, because more likely what you're going to see is you're going to see this. You'll see voltages that range closer to 5.9. Oops. In the 5.9 to 6 volt range. And so they'll all be right about there. You might have one dead one. And we would, what we would probably do in that case is we'd probably replace the one dead one and, and tell you that we can do this as a goodwill thing. But, but again, it wasn't a manufacturing defect that caused the problem. It was, a, it, was a, it was a setting system, settings issue. So make sure that you work through that with every single system because every single customer is different. Now, one of the cool things that, that we just finished, we literally just finished it, or Jeff just finished it this week, is, and it's in your chat, is there is uh, the warranty form is available online now. Will that link work? There we go. And so, um, so if we go to share this, just to confirm, Cameron, you can see the online form. Looks good. Excellent. So you can do the same thing, except for you just do it online. So Steve Higgins, last name or Higgins. I did it again. Email, you know, all the all the information that's absolutely required is marked with the, the star. OK, and so you you go through and you fill it out and you if I try to go next. And that's going to drive some people crazy, but that's the information that we need. It's going to not allow you to submit it until you get all the required information put into the form. And so this might be easier for some folks to fill out directly online. Um, I prefer the old print it out on a piece of paper and fill it out and then take a picture with your cell phone and send it in. When you finish the form, what you want to do is you print it out or you email the PDF. Uh, make sure you save it as a new form. So save as. John Doe system, February 18th, 2021, um, or whatever the name of the system is. And you can email that to support at rollsbattery.com. I'll go back to the main form and show you where that is. Um, you email that to the support address and, or you can fax it for those who are still using fax machines. Um, where is it? There you go. Send it to support at rollsbattery.com. And that what that does is that starts a warranty ticket for us. Once we get that warranty ticket, um, either Jeff, I, or John start looking through those tickets. And then we look through this, we qualify it, we ask any questions. You know, if you've got the form 100% complete, everything looks kosher, you won't even get an email back. Next email you'll get is an approval saying to go pick up the battery at HES or to, it's a prorative warranty and whatever it is. So, um, you know, the online form is sent to technical support. Okay, yeah, so when you submit the, when you go to the online form and you submit that in, when you finally hit complete and you submit that, that'll automatically gener generate an email to the technical support group. And uh, Jeff, I, or John Thompson will be looking at that and 
we'll either contact you and uh, ask more questions or we'll contact you and let you know you can pick up the battery at HES or wherever, you know, we'll, we're going to ask you where you want to pick the battery up and all that stuff at if, if, it's, if it's a warranty. Um, anyways, um, I think that is all the time I have, right, Cameron? Uh, yeah, that about I, I skimmed the next three minutes. <laughs> so, so sly, so sly. Yep. Um, um, did you want to go through any more of those uh, Q and A's before we jump to the meeting, or um, are you pretty good? I think you did nail. I think all I, got, them, I, so. I think we did them as on order, so I don't think we have any any questions that we haven't asked. Um, let me so, show one more thing. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so um, I'm going to try to see if I can get uh, Cameron to send me the video, send me the video so I can post it as well. Now that I've, I've told it in front of everybody. Um, but we also have a YouTube channel, um, which we currently have uh, 641 subscribers. So we're not quite to a thousand yet, but I've got 34 hours of content on, or actually about 40 hours worth of content and 34 different videos um, from anywhere from doing series parallel circuits to completing the warranty claim form to battery bank commissioning, uh, tips and tricks on using Outback products, Magnum products, Schneider products, low battery cutout settings uh troubleshooting uh and load testing there's the load testing one and so i've got lots of videos here if you're really really bored and you really want to listen to my voice for another 40 hours um i would say that you have a problem if you want to listen to my voice for another 40 hours but there's some really good content there so that's great uh, I, should make, hey, jeff. I should make jeff do those for a while <laughs> He's going to jump on soon, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll check that uh, YouTube link in the chat if you've got it there. Yeah, I'll dump it in the chat. Um, let's see here. There you go. It's in the chat. Perfect. Well, Steve, thank you so much for the presentation today. That was that was awesome. Really well done. Um, what we're going to do now is we're all going to jump over to the meeting and I just put in the meeting ID into the chat uh, window as well. So what I do is actually Steve and Jeff, if you could jump over to there first, um, just follow that link. Uh, uh, Meredith is there right now. And what's going to happen is we're going to try and get all of the everybody here. So all of, all of you uh, installers and uh, dealers. Um, if you want to jump into these meetings as well and do some live uh, live chats with Jeff, um, with Steve, um, and and any of uh, uh, there's a whole host of HES staff there as well. We're more than happy to get in there and we can have uh, uh, a talk about any of the projects that are ongoing or any of the projects that you're wanting to plan or anything that is uh, upcoming uh, would be um, stuff that you can do there. And for, uh, for, for those of you who haven't done it yet, once you click that link, it'll ask you to launch Zoom. And then once it does that, you'll see another button that will appear that you know asks you to leave one meeting and join another. So don't be scared when you see those come up. That's just the normal part of the process. Yeah. And for everyone else, also, we do have, obviously, uh, it's uh, off-grid Thursday today, uh, Grid Tide Tuesdays. Uh, we've got, I believe, uh, Fronius is next Tuesday, Ed. Is that right? So that's awesome. Um, and they will be, uh, and then the schedule is also uh, within all of your emails. Um, and we'll be hosting all of this within our uh, portal, uh, our, D our HES dealer portal um, going forward. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump over the breakout room as well. So see you there. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. Um, for any of you that have any more questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm going to hang out here for a little bit. Um, you can put up your hand if you want to just have a chat and talk marketing because I can help you with that too. We can talk, uh, we can do some chatting here about uh, stuff that we can help you with your marketing campaigns. Um, typically we can do all sorts of help as far as, uh, websites, as far as, uh, any social media or, or Google ad campaigns. Um, 
we have a large capacity of, of what we can do for our dealers and we try and do them do it in a way that is uh, you know beneficial to both of us we're not gonna we're gonna uh, as a dealer, as a preferred dealer, we typically give you uh, some some low costs to to make sure that you're marketing yourself as best as you can. Um, and that, what is the meeting passcode? There shouldn't be a passcode, Daniel. Um, you should be able to just jump right in there. Um, let me have a see. Yes, I can resend a Zoom link. Here, let's try that again. And if that, hopefully that link works, um, I can't actually test it because uh, then I would end this meeting and then everybody would be, uh... but what I can do is, hold on, Daniel, let me see if I can see you there. I'm gonna allow you to talk here. And if you want to chat, um, you're still having some issues, let me know. Um, hey, I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot again. I, uh... When I tried last time, I just said, what is the meeting passcode when they uh, actually join? So I'll, I'll try again right that, now. The, it, it, Daniel, it may be because you're still in this one. Sometimes you have to leave this one and then, so we, you might want to just copy that, uh, okay. that code and then leave and then jump back, jump into that one uh, like that. Okay, I'll uh, give it a shot. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Um, and for anybody else who, has a has some any issues? Like I said, and hang out here for another five minutes, um, and you can uh, and hopefully uh, I can help you out with anything. Um, like we said earlier, our dealer portal is uh, up and running. We've got a bunch of people in there watching the videos already. One thing that we've got to uh, remember, though, is that the syncing uh, uh, is a little bit off right now for the uh, newer accounts. And that doesn't mean that it's, I shouldn't even say newer accounts, because some of the older accounts are newer, have newer email settings. So they're actually, even though they're an older account, they still have a new email, which is causing some issues. Um, that should be solved this week, hopefully by mid next week. Um, and we'll know, we'll know more about that, uh, over the next couple of days. We've been working on it pretty nonstop, but it's, uh, some of it's a little bit tricky. Um, but yeah, it looks like, uh, we're down to the majority of people have joined the meeting or have they've gone, uh, gone home, but like I said a minute ago, Jeff and Steve are uh, currently in those uh, live face-to-face -face meetings. And if you wanted to go and join them, you would be more than welcome to go and have a little chat about all sorts of battery topics du jour. Um, looking for, uh, yeah, any of your issues or problems that they can help with. Um, hey, George, hold on one sec. Yeah, I'll put you on here. Hey George, so if you see in the chat menu, I don't know. I've just I've just allowed you to chat for a second here. Can you hear me, Cam? I can hear I can hear you loud and clear, George. How are you doing? I am doing awesome. It's great to see you. <laughs> well, it's great to hear you. Uh, it's nice to hear you doing so good too. Um, so if you look now, do you see your little chat menu there? Can you uh, at the yeah. bottom? You're allowed. If you click on that and it opens it up, there should be um, uh, a link there that says zoom.us 919-0757, et cetera. Do you see that link? Uh, yeah, there's, there's uh Scroll to the bottom, use the one that was posted at 139. It's probably the, it's probably the best one. Okay, the bottom one? Yeah. Click, click on that. What I would do is I would right click. Uh, oh, you can't copy. Um, yeah, I would just click on that and see how it goes. And if it okay, I I clicked it, on it and it's loading something. All right. Well, it might kick you out of this conversation. So oh. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it checks you. Hopefully it checks you into the next meeting though. Um, okay. And if it doesn't, well. if it doesn't, what I suggest you do is you copy that link, and then leave this meeting and then join that one with that link. 
Okay, it says leave and join. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thanks, right, Cameron. No worries, George. We'll see you on it. I'll see you probably over there in a minute. Okay, thanks. No worries. Take care. Um, well, it looks like we've got uh, four or five of you guys left here. Um, um, Well, for the rest of you guys that are left here, I think I'm actually going to join uh, the meeting on the other side. Um, thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to, to seeing you next Tuesday. All right, guys. Everyone have a great day.